Today's a parish of Sparks, the Torah tidbits on the weekly Torah portion. This week, we're going to be reading Parshas Nasai, which is the second parsha, the second section of the book of Bamidbar, the book of Numbers. There's something unique about this parsha. Every parsha has something that stands out that makes that parsha unique. But what makes this parsha unique, you don't even have to read, but it says just the number of verses. It is the longest parsha in the entire Torah, with a total of 176 verses. This is by far the longest Torah portion that we read throughout the year. And it's not a coincidence that it's read virtually every year, the Shabbos, right after Shavuos, after the holiday in which we relive re-experience the giving of the Torah at Mount Sinai. In some years, it's the Shabbos before Shavuos, but it's always in close proximity to Shavuos. What does that tell you? That when we celebrate the holiday of Shavuos, we translate that experience into the study, the reading of the Torah, and we don't skimp. We do it in grand fashion by reading this long parasha. Now, it's interesting, as it has been pointed out by many, that the longest psalm, the book of Psalms, is Psalm 119, which also has a total of 176 verses. So the longest parsha of the five books of Moses has 176 verses. The longest psalm has 176 verses. And then it's been pointed out that the longest tractate, volume of the Talmud, is Bava Basra, which also has not verses or chapters or uh, parshas, but pages, 176 pages. There must be something special about 176. And one doesn't have to look very far. It finds the answer to that in the Book of Psalms. The Book of Psalms, which, as I mentioned before, in its 119th chapter, has the 176 verses in a very definite and very specific order. It has eight verses that begin with the letter Aleph, then another eight verses that begin with the letter Bez, and then Gimel, and Dalet. In other words, it goes through the entire alphabet, from Aleph through Tav. And each letter has a verse, eight verses, that begin with that same letter. So if you take the 22 letters of the Hebrew alphabet and multiplied by 8, that gives you 176. What is the message there? And the message has to relate to Torah. So it seems that the message is as follows. 22 letters are, of course, the totality of letters that are communicated through the Torah. Now, Torah is knowledge, it's information, it has a lot of historical facts, a lot of stories, and laws, of course, but Torah is not the same as any other subject. It's qualitatively different. And how do you describe something that is transcendent, that is different, qualitatively speaking, that is light years ahead of its competition? If you had to use numbers to describe something that's aloof, something that's beyond and above, something that's even elusive, it would be the number eight. Because seven, as we discussed in many of our classes, is the representation of the cycle of nature. We have a seven-day week, which includes Shabbos, but it's also part of nature. It's part of the process of creation. And it's fascinating that every culture, I can't speak to every culture literally, but every known culture has a seven-day week. I know the communists tried to change that to, to mess people up so they shouldn't be able to, to observe Shabbos. But a seven-day week represents the cycle of nature. God created the world in seven days. Six days of work, one day of rest. Rest is also a creation. So when you talk about the number eight, you're talking about something that transcends creation. And that's exactly the nature of Torah. Psalm 119 is something that every Jew should read, every person should read, because it tells you the true character of King David is often maligned. But King David was the greatest lover of Torah. It's 176 verses 
of his love and passion for the Torah, for the beauty of Torah, for the holiness of Torah, for the justice of Torah, for the delight and pleasure, the sheer pleasure in the study of Torah, and how that delight that he experienced when he studied Torah was able to provide him with the means to survive the ordeals that he had to endure. So what is the, number 176? It's 22 representing the letters of the Torah, but 22 not multiplied by 7, which would be the per peak of nature perfection, but multiplied by 8, which represents that which transcends nature. So the number 176 is not a arbitrary number. It reflects the transcendent nature of Torah, and it's fitting that right after we observe the holiday in which we receive the Torah anew, we focus on this transcendent aspect of Torah. What is the name of the parsha? Naso. The word Naso itself is translated as, in this context, of taking a census. But if you translate it literally, the word Naso in the next two words, Naso as Rosh, it means count the heads, but the word Naso actually, more literally speaking, means lift up the heads, elevate the heads. This is a parsha that elevates our mind to a level that is beyond the norm because this is the level that represents Torah knowledge. Now, if we go into the actual text, the end of the preceding parasha, God commissioned the Levites to do the work in the temple, specifically carrying the temple and all of its implements and the Mishkan, the tabernacle, and all the vessels. And they were told to count the children of Kahas. Kahas was one of the three sons of Levi. Levi is the third son of Jacob. And Levi has three sons, Gershon, Kahas, and Merari. And Kahas were charged with the obligation to carry the ark, and other vessels of the temple. And the Torah commanded us to count them. This week's parsha talks about the other family of Levites, the Gershonites. And the Torah says, take a census of the sons of Gershon as well, Gamhain, they too, according to their father's household, according to their families. So now, we are talking about the family of Gershon. Their job was to carry the curtains that covered the Mishkan. That was their specific responsibility. So the Torah says that not only should you count the children of Kahas, you should also count the children of Gershon. But then when it gets to the third family, the name Merari, the children of Merari, it doesn't mention anything about lifting their heads. It just says, the sons of Merari, according to their families, according to the father's household, shall you count them. It doesn't say anything about lifting their heads to their father's household, according to their father's household, according to their families. So there are three different categories here. You have Kahas, supposed to lift their heads. You have Gershon, that they too should have their heads lifted. Quite not the same as Gahas, but it's still getting close. And then Murari, there's no lift of the heads. What is the difference between these three? So the Chassam Sofa, one of the great 19th century sages, gives a very beautiful explanation. He says that these three sons of Levi represent three stages in Jewish history. Kahas, the word Kahas is connected to the word Kehila, the assembly the gathering, the collective. This represents the Jewish people when they were in Israel on their land as one community, such as in the days of King Solomon. There, the Jews are in a very high level, and therefore you can lift their heads to their fathers. In other words, their connection to their fathers, to the ancestors, to the patriarchs, is a very clear one. Nothing has to be compromised. They are on a very high level that they are connected to their forebears, to their ancestors, to their 
patriarchs and matriarchs, specifically the patriarchs over here. But then you have Gershon. The word, and by the way, Kahas had a few sons. And if you look at the names of the sons, the Chassam Sofa says, they all represent this positive state of affairs. What are the names of the son? Amram, Moses' father. What does Amram mean? An exalted nation. Yitzhar comes from the word Sohar, light. The people who illuminate the world with their Torah, with their piety, with their prayer. You have Hebron. Hebron comes from the word Chibur. They're t attached to each other. They're united. They're one people. Uziel means the strength of God. God's strength is very much in is revealed and is pronounced in this state when, of Kahas, when all the Jews are united together in the land of Israel. But then you have Gershon. Gershon comes to the word to be driven away. That means they're no longer in Israel. They are now in exile. But even in exile, they go through suffering, they go through an ordeal, but they come out stronger as a result. They're still connected to their father's house. Not as much as they were in Israel, but as a result of the suffering in Golos and the persistence of learning Torah and keeping mitzvahs, one of the sons of Gershon, Livni, love comes to the word white, they have become purified and refined, and Shimi comes from the word Shema. They listen, they're hearing, they're listening to God's words. They may not see godliness, but they hear it. They understand it. They can relate to it. They, too, are connected to their fathers. But then you get to Merari. Merari comes from a word that means bitter, like Miriam, Mar, bitter. This is the ultimate worst phase of Jewish history, such as, of course, some Sulfur didn't speak about the Holocaust, but he could have been speaking about the pogroms in the 17th century. He could have been speaking about the Crusades or the Inquisition. He could have been speaking about many other periods of Jewish history. But it's especially relevant to the last period of Jewish history where the Jews went through unspeakable and unprecedented bitterness and suffering. And this generation, though it may seem that they are the lowest, what are the names of the children? Machli. My illness, mushi, means pushed away. They're driven out. They're pushed away from where they belong. And nevertheless, the Torah doesn't say they too are, their heads are raised. They don't have to have their heads raised. This is a surprise ending. You would think that he would say this is the lowest of the three. He says, on the contrary, these people are on the highest of levels. They don't have to be connected to their fathers because they are greater than their fathers. This statement of the Chassam Sofer echoes something the Alter Rebbe, the first Chabad Rebbe, once said, commenting on another verse in this week's parsha, the, the next week's parsha, I should say, at the very end, it talks about how Moses was the most humble person on the face of the earth. And the question is, how could a man who knew that he was the greatest person that ever lived, the greatest prophet, and that God himself told him that, how could he have been so humble? The classic answer is that he knew that his gifts were given to him by God. But still, what humbled him? What made him feel so humble? The Alter Rebbe once explained that God gave Moses a vision of the future, as the Talmud relates. When he came to the last generation, the last period of exile before Mashiach, which obviously is referring to our generation, the last century, and perhaps even the last few decades, and he saw the difficulties, the trials the Jews will go through, unprecedented, and he could have been referring to the suffering and pain of the Holocaust, or the communist tyranny, or he could have been referring to the threat of enticing assimilation that exists in the Western world, which has taken so many Jewish lives from us, spiritually speaking. These twin phenomena, the persecution and the assimilation, have been the greatest test that any nation could have ever endured, and yet we came out of these tests intact. We still have not lost them. We have not lost our faith, and we will not lose our faith. We are committed to Torah and to mitzvahs. When Moses saw that, he was floored. He was humbled. It's the, precisely our generation 
that may appear to be murari, bitter, we may appear to be machli, ill, we're not in good spiritual health, it's precisely our generation that has shown so much spiritual wonders that we are still strong in our commitment and therefore we transcend our fathers. They look to us as the ones who will bring the Mashiach and the redemption. Later on in the parish, well, if we, if we survey the parish, it talks about the role of the sons of Levi, what they had to do in the Mishkan. It talks about the laws of impurity, that people who are ritually impure should be sent away from the Mishkan, the tabernacle, the portable temple in the desert. It talks about giving the gifts of one's produce to the Kohen, referring specifically, as Rashi says, to Bikurim, to the first fruits that you bring to the temple, and then you give it to the Kohen. We'll talk a little bit more about that later if we have time. But then it talks about the laws of adultery, so a woman suspected of adultery and how she would be tested. Then it talks about a nazir, a person who makes a vow not to drink wine, and other restrictions, and how the Torah says he's supposed to behave, and how he ends his period of abstinence. Then it has the priestly blessings that a Kohen has to bless the Jewish people. And then the Torah goes through the dedicatory offering is brought by the twelve leaders of the twelve tribes. That takes up the balance of this parsha. If you look for a theme that runs through all of these, a thread, I should say, that runs through all these different themes, it's the theme of shalom, of peace. The idea of peace, because the, the Talmud tells us, and Maimonides codifies this, lo nitna Torah ela lasa shalom ba'olam. Torah was given exclusively to bring peace to the world. Now here it doesn't mean peace, the way we talk about peace with North Korea, we talk about peace in the Middle East, that's definitely part of it. But peace is a much more uh, ubiquitous concept. It applies to so many different areas of life. Number one, there's peace between God and the world. Peace between the physical and the spiritual. Peace between husband and wife. Peace between body and soul. Peace between one neighbor and another neighbor. Peace between one community and another, one country and another. All these forms of peace are all lumped together in one word in Hebrew, which is shalom. It's actually, it's interesting, the Talmud says that if you have a dream of any of these three things, it's a sign of peace. A pot, a river, or a bird. What's the significance of this? A pot, they explain, is what makes peace between fire and water. You want to put fire and water together, one will evaporate the other, or one will extinguish the other. You put water in a pot, and you put the pot on fire, you can cook food. That's peace within the home. Then you have the river. The river travels from one place to another. That's where you extend the peace outside of your own environment, of your own community. But still, the rivers don't flow outside of your country. Usually they only stay within a certain prescribed geographic area. Then you have a bird that can fly across the sea to a completely different part of the world. So there are different stages and different levels of peace. And if you go through all these themes, they all revolve around the concept of peace. The sacrifices that were brought in the temple, those were intended to bring peace between God and the world. So all the verses about the dedication, the dedicatory sacrifices brought by the leaders, they all reflect this unity between God and the world. In fact, the word for one of the offerings is shlamin, the peace offering, because it brings peace between God and the world. Then you have the priestly blessing, where he blesses all the people. That's the idea of peace between, within the Jewish community. Then it has the laws of a woman suspected of adultery and how she's to be cleared. That refers to the peace in, in the home, the domestic peace. Then you have the nausea, who was a person who's steeped in in physical hedonistic pleasures and therefore makes a vow not to drink wine, to abstain, that's to, cre to create a real healthy balance between body and soul, to bring peace between body and soul. So we have all these different aspects of peace all hinted in this parasha. Now getting back to what I was saying before about the giving of the first fruits, the Torah describes that 
as if it's a two-stage process. First, you bring it to the temple. Once it's in the temple, you give it to the Kohen. Why couldn't they just say, bring it to the Kohen? So the Rebbe says there's a very basic lesson over here when it comes to giving charity. I guess this is based on human psychology. Some people, they feel that when it comes to giving to God, yes, of course I have to give God. God created me. God sustains me. God gave me all my wealth. Whatever I have is His. I owe Him something. So if the temple demands or asks for some type of contribution, an offering, why not bring it to the temple? But when the Torah says, give it to the Kohen, or parallel that would be, give it to a poor person rather than to an institution, sometimes you find people, of course this is a generalization, there are many people who would take exception to this, but there are many people who would say, why should I give it to him or her? Let them work for it. Or, it's my money, why should I share it with someone else? If it's God, okay, God is different. He owns everything. Every belongs to God, and I have to show him my gratitude. But this poor man never did anything for me. Why should I share my wealth with him? So that's what the Torah says. Before you give it to the Kohen, we don't want you to give it to him begrudgingly, reluctantly. Give it to the temple. This is God's. And that people are happy to do. The Kohen was usually brought with a lot of fanfare, with a lot of joy and celebration. One sits in God's possession, and then you give it to the Kohen, you don't feel bad about it anymore. Why? Because it's not yours. You've given it away already. It would be directly to the Kohen, you might have some misgivings, which is wrong. And, it, and there are some people who actually are the other way around. They, they feel a lot of compassion for poor people, but they don't have that feeling for organizations. And they would rather give to an individual than to give to, to an organization. Well, that's a different type of mentality, and the Torah addresses that in other places, how to deal with that kind of a mentality, where you give to the poor, but you won't give to an organization. Because the reason why people sometimes give to the poor is not because they care for the poor, but they care for their own sensibilities. They cannot tolerate seeing someone suffering. So some people wouldn't walk by a place where they see people living in squalor, so they'll take a circuitous route to get home so they don't have to see the suffering. Now, that's not a sign of nobility, that's a sign of you're just concerned with your own feelings and not with the need to help those who are destitute and can use your help. So that's a different problem and has a different approach. Here we're talking about the person who would give to God but would feel difficulty in giving to an individual. Then the Torah, as I mentioned before, speaks about a woman suspected of adultery. Now, the Hebrew word for that person is sota. Sota is connected to the word in Hebrew, shota. Shota means a fool, an imbecile. So what's the common denominator in those two words? So to literally means deviating. Someone who deviates from the norm of decency, civility, modesty, holiness, purity. But what is a shota, a fool, an imbecile? Someone who deviates from the norm of rationality. Someone who does not behave rationally. But the teachings of Hasidus tell us that there are actually two types of what was what is called shtus, folly, foolishness. You have foolishness where you go beneath the line of normalcy, and you have foolishness, folly, that goes above and beyond the line. When people learn to follow Jewish law, and they find in themselves the ability to live a Jewish life, they carve out a comfortable niche, and that's where they will stay. They will extend their devotion to God, to Torah and mitzvahs, as far as they, their comfort zone will take them. That's better than nothing, but that's not the ideal. The ideal is for us to go beyond the line, to go above and beyond that line, and even to do things that may act as if 
and they sound like they're foolish. For example, King David, when he brought the ark from captivity back to where it belonged, he was jumping, gesticulating, dancing, prancing, and his own wife, the daughter of King Saul, was taken aback and it was critical of him that it's not becoming for a king. And he says, no, may I look like a fool in the presence of God. That means that when you're serving God, you do not, do not base your observance on what seems normal and rational. That's the antidote for all the folly in the world. We're living in an age where you're seeing two extremes. You're seeing both extremes would be called shtus, folly. But because there's so much folly in the negative direction, people who are leading all sorts of crazy lifestyles and calling that normal, we have to be quote unquote crazy in the opposite extreme and going beyond our own comfort zones to doing what God wants us to do. Then we have the story of the Nazir. The Nazir is a person who makes a vow to separate himself, to abstain from wine, can't cut his hair, everyone knows the story of Samson, and can't go to a cemetery, cannot come into contact with a dead body for as long as the term, it's usually a 30-day term of being Nazir. It can be longer, it can be for life, but it's usually 30 days. Now, there's a controversy over here it seems to be a contradiction in the way our sages look at this. In one place, our sages seem to suggest that it's an act of holiness to abstain. And in other places, it seems it's a sin, that you're causing yourself unnecessary deprivation. God gives us enough prohibitions. Why are you adding on a new one, not drinking wine? So which is it? Is it a mitzvah or is it a sin? So the Tosvah's commentary, super commentary of the Talmud by Rashi's, grandchildren and their disciples explains that it's a mitzvah, but there's also a little bit of a sin attached to it. In other words, it's not the ideal. The ideal is not for a person to deprive himself or herself of those things that the Torah allows us to eat and consume. On the contrary, we should use the food or whatever it is that we indulge in, not for the sake of physical gratification, but for the sake of getting our strength and our health so we can be able to serve God, live our lives to the fullest. Then, taking the wine out of our, our daily routine, or weekly routine, would seem to be a little bit of a sin, because that's not the ideal. But if a person feels that they are so immersed in worldly pleasures, they have such hedonistic tendencies that they can't control themselves, and they feel the only way they can control themselves if they go to the other extreme of abstinence, then, though it's not an ideal, it's in a sense it's like a little sin, the word sin in Hebrew chet means you're lacking something, nevertheless the need of the moment, the, is the mitzvah overrides the sin. There's a beautiful explanation from one of the students of the Baal Shem Tov. He was once challenged why Hasidim celebrate so much. They say L'chaim, they drink wine, they sing and they dance, and there's so much joy. He says, how could you be joyous in a period of exile? And the student of the Baal Shem Tov told him the following. We see that the Nazir, on one hand, could be called a mitzvah, on the other hand, it could be called a sin. Why? So he gave this approach. Right before the laws of the Nazir, we read, as I mentioned before, about the woman suspected of adultery. So the Talmud says, why are these two subjects juxtaposed? Adultery and not drinking wine? Because if a person sees the way this woman is degraded because of her lack of modesty and betrayal to her husband, her impurity, that's a sign that you should keep away from wine, because wine could cause that. Levity and frivolity, drunkenness could cause all sorts of immoral behavior. So we said, that's what the key over here is. When you look at a person and you see their negativity, you see the negative in them, 
you better not drink wine. You better not celebrate too much because that will only reinforce all the negativity that you have in your head about others and about the world. But if you see the good in others, if you see the good in the world, you don't look at the glass half empty, you look at the glass half full. And yes, you do have to take note of the negatives so you can avoid the negatives, but not to focus your attention and dwell on them and define your experience as negative. But you see the positive, then drinking wine only enhances your positive attitude and therefore it becomes a mitzvah. Then we go on to the dedicatory offerings. The one we brought on the first day was Nachshon ben Aminadab. Nachshon, the son of Aminadab of the tribe of Yehuda. This is in chapter 7, verse 12. And the verse begins with the words, Vayehi, and it came to pass. The one who offered on the first day his sacrifice was Nachshon ben Aminadab. So there are two questions here. Number one, uh, it says the word Vayehi, that's the opening word, and it came to pass. The Talmud says that the word Vayehi usually indicates that something negative has happened, some type of misfortune, something painful has occurred. What's painful over here? This is a joyous occasion. They're dedicating the Mishka. The second question is, the way the verse is phrased, it sounds like that the sacrifice was Nachshon. In the English translation, it reads, the one who brought his offering on the first day was Nachshon Sinam Aminadav. But that's not how it's translated literally. If I translate it literally, it would read, and it came to pass, the, the, offer, the offerer on the first day, his sacrifice, Nachshon. Not his name was Nachshon, but it seems like he was the sacrifice. And the Pinchas of Karitz, the famous Hasidic master, a disciple of the Baal Shem Tov, answered that Nachshon was such a humble man that when he was chosen to be the first, he was in distress. He says, why me? Why should I be chosen? Who am I? And his humility was so profound that he was actually the sacrifice. What he brought later was the icing on the cake, but the cake here was, the sacrifice here was that he had humbled himself. That's the ultimate offering when a person is able to humble himself. We all remember the story of King Saul who was told to wipe out a Amalek, destroy their animals, and he didn't do that because he thought he could use the animals for sacrifices. And the prophet castigated him and says, God wants you to listen to him more than a good sacrifice. So the... the, the deeper understanding of that is but when you listen to God, when you surrender your own opinions to that which is higher than you, when you have this humility, that is the ultimate sacrifice. And therefore, Nachshon, by bringing his offering first in the spirit of who am I, feeling, expressing humility, by he, it was painful for him, it was distressful for him that he should get this honor that he felt he didn't deserve, by virtue of that, he brought himself as the sacrifice. There's one final concept or insight. I mentioned that this is the longest parsha in the Torah, but if you look at it, uh, the, the dedication of the Mishkan begins in chapter 7, and it goes on until the end of the parsha, virtually to the end, which is verse 89. So you have over 80 verses that's almost half of the whole parsha is dedicated to the offerings of these 12 tribes. So you would think, well, 12 offerings take space. They're all the same. They're all identical. It should have just said, Nachshon brought this and this offering, and then Ditto. And all the other 11 leaders of the tribes brought the exact same offering. That would have been the end of the parsha. You could have done it in 10 verses instead of 80, 89 verses. So one of the answers to this is that this is the beauty of Judaism. Judaism is, on one hand, uniform, 
We all dive in the same davening, but there's some differences here and there. We learn the same Torah, we do the same mitzvahs. So people will say, well, that's boring. Everyone does the same thing, no creativity, no originality, no innovation. No, that's not true. Even though each one brought the identical offering, as did the others, each one had a completely different way of viewing his or her offering. Each had a different interpretation of it. It's like, and the analogy to this Lahavdil would be, take uh, someone playing concerto, every conductor has his or her interpretation of it. So it's the same music, but it's totally different. Judaism is one Judaism. We don't make up our own mitzvahs. We do the same mitzvahs they've been doing for thousands of years, but yet every day you can add new flavor, new meaning, new depth, new soul, new light. And in that sense, everyone brings a different offering, even though it looks to the outsider as if we're all doing the same thing. When Mashiach comes, the whole world will be united. We'll all be serving God. It says Shechem Echad will be serving God with one consent. Yet, there'll still be all the differences that we have today. Israel will still be divided into 12, actually 13 sections. Because the ultimate perfection is when you have unity within the diversity. Have a good evening and a good Shabbos.